the winter months of 1959, a group of nine young, experienced hikers began their journey into the Ural Mountains of Russia. This wasn't the first cold weather trip that these hikers had taken, but tragically, it would be their last. During the trip, the hikers encountered something in the supposedly desolate region that led to the deaths of the entire group. What exactly happened that night is still unknown, but the incident has since become one of the world's greatest mysteries, with the details and evidence being some of the most shocking that I've ever investigated. So to preface how we know so much about this story, cameras and diaries belonging to the group were actually found at the campsite that show the actions and the thoughts of each of the 10 hikers. And because of the cameras found at the campsite, many of the photographs used within this video are going to be actual shots taken by the Dietlov group. The story of the Dietlov Pass incident began at the Ural Polytechnical Institute where a group of current and former students formed a crew to trek across the Ural Mountains. Now the ski trip was not what you would expect from a group of college students. Each of the members of the 10-man group were certified grade two hikers, and the completion of the trip would make them grade three, which at the time was the most prestigious hiking certificate in the Soviet Union. Because of this, the trip was quite serious with booze and cigarettes being left behind in order to avoid distraction. The goal was for the hikers to reach the mountain of Gora Orton, and the track that the hikers would be taking was rated at the highest possible difficulty. Still though, the group remained confident that they would be able to complete the journey as they were properly prepared and properly trained. Their journey started on the 25th of January as the group began traveling towards the village of Vizhai. Once there, the hikers rested for the night and began their hike on the 27th. But for one of the hikers, bad luck would strike early. Just one day into the hike, the then 21-year-old Yuri Yudin began to suffer from severe joint pain. Yudin had been plagued by many health problems over the course of his life, and the limitations it placed on him were obviously quite frustrating. But in this case, his untimely health problems may have actually saved his life. With the pain in his joints becoming too much to bear, Yudin decided that he would only slow the hikers down if he stayed, so he said goodbye to his team and he headed home completely unaware of the tragedy that was soon to unfold. The departure of Yudin left the group with nine people, seven men and two women. The leader of the group, Igor Dyatlov, was said to be extremely knowledgeable and experienced, and by all accounts, he was a very well-respected leader. As the group traversed through what has now become the Dyatlov Pass, severe weather had caused them to lose their bearings and eventually end up on the side of the mountain Kolatsaikal, or as it was better known by the local Mansi tribe, Dead Mountain. It was late at this point, and the weather was anything but stable, so Dyatlov made the questionable decision to pitch the tent and hunker down until sunrise. It's believed that none of the hikers would make it that far. In the midst of their trip, Igor Dyatlov had told Yuri Yudin as he was leaving that the group would send a telegram once they had returned back from their journey. Dyatlov believed the trip would likely take 16 days, but a few extra days were possible due to the unpredictable weather of the region. Yudin had waited for the telegram for weeks, but it never came. This caused him to report the group as missing, and by the end of February, a search party was underway. On the 26th of February, a search party was able to locate the tent in which the hikers had spent their final night in. Upon further investigation, it was discovered that the tent was cut open from the inside by one of the hikers. With these hikers being as experienced as they were, they would not have done this unless they were extremely spooked by something. And the condition of the tent shows that the group likely cut the tent open from the inside in order to flee from something. And think about how crazy this is. Something had to scare them so badly and make them wanna flee so quickly that they sliced open their only bit of shelter. Not only this, but the hikers had fled their tent so quickly that most were not wearing shoes, and none were properly dressed for the negative 30 degree temperature, with some venturing out of the tent in only their underwear. Perhaps even more shockingly, 
The footsteps of all nine of the hikers were discovered heading away from the campsite, which revealed something strange. Rather than the footprints being sporadic, as one would expect if they were running away from something, they were instead extremely organized. One by one, the hikers walked single file down the hill in their bare feet and socks with hardly any clothes on as they slowly began to freeze to death. Each and every one of the deaths on the Dyatlov Pass seems suspicious. Investigators set out on the morning of February the 27th with high confidence that the members of the group would be found alive. The tent was located and the footprints were located. Now all that's left to do was find these extremely experienced hikers. While combing the area around a patch of trees, a member of the search party noticed that there was something brown sticking out of the snow near an old cedar tree. As they approached, they noticed that all of the branches on the lower part of the tree had been broken off, which might have suggested that somebody had possibly tried to climb it. Remains of an old fire were found under the tree as well, and next to this fire was where the first bodies were found. Yuri Doroshenko was the first hiker found. He was lying face down in the snow, wearing a short sleeve t-shirt and swimming trunks. He was wearing two socks with no shoes. Doroshenko had a large burn on the right side of his head and on his foot. Along with this, he also had gray fluid coming out of his mouth. His body was covered in scrapes and bruises, and his ears, nose, and lips were covered in blood. It is speculated that these injuries were self-inflicted and done out of agony as Doroshenko was quite literally being frozen to death. The gray fluid found coming out of Doroshenko's mouth is typically a sign that the body had experienced a strong force to their chest cavity. This perhaps suggests that Doroshenko had possibly fallen from the cedar tree or that somebody else had pressed on his chest with extreme force. Despite these strange findings, Doroshenko's official cause of death was labeled as hypothermia and the detail of the gray fluid found in his mouth never made the initial report. 23-year-old Yuri Kravanashenko was found lying next to Doroshenko under the cedar tree. He was found wearing a long-sleeved shirt and a single sock. His body was heavily bruised with multiple cuts as well. Burns were found on his foot and up his legs as well as on both of his hands. Inside of his mouth, a chunk of his own knuckle was found, which may have been done while Kravanashenko was biting his knuckle in order to either stay conscious or to stop himself from crying. Later investigation revealed that both of the first two bodies were moved after death. What may have happened in this situation was that other members of the group found the two dead and put their bodies in an orderly manner out of respect. Other members of the group may have took the men's clothing to divide up amongst themselves in a desperate attempt to stay warm. The next body to be found was that of Igor Dyatlov, the leader of the group. Dyatlov was found face up with both of his fists clenched, and his body had also been clearly manipulated after his death. Dyatlov had abrasions and bruises on both of his ankles, as well as cuts and bruises on his face. He was missing an incisor in his jaw, and the coroner reported that these injuries were consistent with that of those caused by a fist fight. His official death was hypothermia. Zineda Kolomogorova was the first of the women to be found. She was found better dressed than the others, but one of the sweaters she was wearing had part of its right sleeve torn off. She had abrasions on both of her hands and bruises on her face. Another long bruise was found at the side of her body, which apparently showed consistency to a hit from a baton. These injuries show a potential sign of struggle and her official cause of death was labeled as hypothermia due to a violent accident. Both Kolomogorova and Dyatlov were likely trying to make their way back to the tent when they both perished. It wouldn't be for another week that the next body was found. 23-year-old Rustam Slobodan was found on March 5th, lying face down and covered in snow. He had internal bleeding in both of his temples and a large fracture on his skull. Whatever caused the fracture and hemorrhaging is unclear, but medical experts concluded that Slobodan likely survived the injury for up to an hour after it had happened. It is theorized that Slobodan became extremely disoriented and dizzy after suffering these injuries and collapsed on the ground. Still conscious and awake, Slobodan quickly died of hypothermia. 
His body too showed signs that it had been moved post-mortem. Months would go by until a member of the Mansi tribe discovered a den created by the surviving hikers. This den was a last ditch effort for the remaining four to survive the frigid cold, but ultimately, it was unsuccessful. Ludmina de Benina was found with her body draped over a natural ledge with running water flowing directly next to her body. The tissue around her lips and her mouth were missing, exposing her teeth and her upper jaw. Soft tissue was also missing in other parts of her face, revealing her cheekbone in one area. Ten of her ribs were broken, and massive hemorrhaging had occurred in her heart. Both of her eye sockets were empty, meaning that both of her eyes had been removed. This wasn't the only feature on her head that was missing, however. Dubonina's tongue had been removed, and it was nowhere to be found. Blood found within the stomach suggests that she was alive when this occurred. Her cause of death was hemorrhaging into the right atrium of the heart, making her one of the only deaths to officially be ruled as something other than hypothermia. Semyon Zolotorov, the oldest member of the group, was found slightly more prepared for the elements than the others. He had three pairs of pants on, and he wore a long jacket over his sweater, with two hats, a scarf, and boots. Despite him having at least some preparation for the cold, he too perished along with the others. Much like Dubonina, Zolotoryov had mysteriously suffered injuries to his chest, resulting in five broken ribs and a flail chest. He was missing tissue along his right eyebrow, which revealed his exposed skull bone. He also had a deep gash in the back of his head, which too revealed blood. Zolotoryov was also found without eyes. His cause of death was quickly ruled hypothermia, despite the strange unexplained injuries that he had suffered. Both Zolotoryov and Dubonina had suffered their chest injuries whilst they were still alive. Medical experts concluded that their injuries were caused by a large force and could not have been caused by another human. Their internal injuries were similar to something you would see from a car accident. But despite this, neither had any bruising or marks where the force would have hit. This point alone continues to baffle researchers and remains unexplained how it could even be possible. Alexander Kulatov was found near the den, along with the others. Though not ideal, his clothing was better than the majority of his companions. However, there were rips and tears found on his jacket and on his pants. Along with these rips, burn marks were found on his jacket and socks. Kolevatov was missing both of his eyebrows, and bone could be seen where they once were. His nose was broken and his neck was deformed, meaning that it was likely snapped. A gash was also found behind his right ear. Despite the clear and obvious signs of a major struggle, the autopsy was left vague and concluded that he too had died from hypothermia. The vagueness of the autopsy was fairly consistent with the remaining victims found in May of that year. Little explanation was given to any of their injuries, and the autopsies were found to be very misleading. Nikolay Brignoli was similar to Zolotoryov in the fact that both were somewhat prepared for the outdoor elements. It has long since been believed that Brignoli and Zolotoryov were outside of the tent at the time that the others fled, which would explain why they were already prepared for the cold. Brignoli was found with bruising on his lips and on the lower left side of his face. He had bled internally on his lower right forearm. Along with this, his skull was fractured and cracked all over the left side of his head. These fractures would have had to have been caused by an extremely powerful force, but no damage was done to the soft tissue on the top of the fracture, meaning that again, another human could not have inflicted these injuries. Upon suffering this injury, Brignoli would likely have been in an unconscious state and would have died no more than three hours later. His death too was officially blamed by a powerful force that could not have been caused by a human. Each and every one of the deaths on the Dyatlov Pass seemed suspicious. All of the hikers had bruising and cuts on their bodies, specifically on their faces, and most had other shocking and disturbing injuries that were left unexplained. But one of the more shocking things revealed in this case has yet to be discussed in this video. It is believed that the last four hikers had taken clothes from some of the corpses once they had passed away in a desperate attempt to survive the freezing cold. So when the final four bodies were found, they were all wearing clothes from the victims who died before them. It was discovered that on these clothes, trace amounts of radiation were detected. 
And adding to that, radiation was also detected in the entire area of the Dyatlov Pass at the time. It is believed that there is no natural way that this radiation could have been found on their bodies, but an explanation as to how it got there has never been offered. Looking at these deaths as a whole, no part of the situation seems to make any sense. From the ripping open of the tent, to the single file walk down the mountain, to the horrific injuries, and finally the radiation, everything just seems out of whack, which is why this case has become one of the most mysterious of all time. And due to its popularity and widespread appeal, thousands of theories have been put forth as to what may have caused all of this. Here are some of the more popular ones. One of the earliest theories to come out of this event was the idea that the local Mansi tribe had killed the hikers. As I mentioned earlier, a storm had caused the hikers to wander off course and end up on what is now known as Death Mountain. The mountain was home to the Mansi people, and it was theorized that they attacked the hikers when they ventured onto their land. One piece of evidence to support this was the fact that a Manchi chum was found just a few hundred meters away from the campsite. Supposedly, a chum was a symbolic structure that was created at the time of a sacrifice. Could the Manchi people have sacrificed the hikers or killed them for stepping onto their land? It could be somewhat possible, and taking a look at the pictures that the Dyatlov group had taken prior to their death, it is clear that they were stepping on the land of the secluded tribe. The tribe isn't always welcoming to visitors, so perhaps this led to a conflict. What could also support this theory was the fact that the Manchi people knew this land better than anyone else in the world. Perhaps they could have covered up their tracks and staged the murders in a such a strange way that they knew it would never be solved. Now this theory is so intriguing to me because it would answer why the hikers fled their tents so quickly. Perhaps they realized they were about to be attacked and they tried to escape from the tribe. Also, it would explain why they walked single file down the hill, because maybe they were being led there and told to do so. Ultimately, the theory for the Manchi people having killed the hikers sounds somewhat believable. But at the end of the day, if you really dig into it, it doesn't make enough sense. How would this explain the injuries suffered by the hikers? The coroner clearly said that a few of these injuries could not have been caused by a human, so that alone makes this theory very unlikely. Plus the idea of them covering up every single one of their footprints seems far-fetched. Finally, the chum that was found in the area of the hikers' disappearances was likely for the sacrifice of a moose, which they would have then used for food. This seems to be confirmed by the moose antlers on top of the structure, and it's now been practically debunked that the Manchi people ever even performed human sacrifices. As time has gone on, it has become somewhat clear that the Manchi people were used as an early cop-out as to what happened to these people. But years later, the theory has since been debunked, leading us to look for answers. Our second theory is an explanation as to why the hikers fled their tent so quickly. For them to practically destroy their main piece of shelter, they had to have been certain that their lives were in danger. And they had to think that this danger was approaching so quickly that they had to leave without proper provisions. Because of this, and the location of the tent, many now believe that an avalanche had caused the hikers to flee that day. Though this specific area is not known for having frequent avalanches, they were camped at the base of a mountain, meaning that they could have been in a direct path of an incoming avalanche. This theory would explain why the hikers cut their tent open in such a hurry and left the safety of their shelter with only light clothing on. And for obvious reasons, this has been the widespread theory that many have settled on. However, it's not without issues. For starters, this theory doesn't explain how the hikers suffered such serious injuries. Remember, those who had suffered broken bones showed no signs of tissue damage near their injuries. This is significant because if an avalanche had caused a rock to strike them or caused them to crash into a tree or something like that, there would have been significant damage to their tissue around their broken bones. I mean, there would have been at the very least major bruising, and they would have been completely covered with cuts and scrapes from head to toe. Also, there was never any sign that an avalanche had taken place in that area that night. And though this is impossible to totally prove, 
Scientists had agreed that it is unlikely that this ever took place. Now, Despite this theory being practically ruled out, an avalanche still could be partially to blame. Perhaps the hikers had just thought that an avalanche was coming. Maybe they heard a loud noise or something like that and they panicked and cut open the tent. And when they realized their mistake, they walked single file into the woods in order to get shelter in the trees. I think this situation sounds very rational, but it still doesn't explain what actually killed the hikers. If they really thought there was an avalanche and that's what caused them to flee, then something outside of their shelter must have killed them. But what could have possibly caused such horrific injuries? With little to go off of in terms of rational theories, many have began looking to the supernatural as a cause for this tragedy, and the main talking point is typically the Yeti. Perhaps a large and violent creature was living in the remote area of the Dyatlov Pass, and it took issue with the hikers being in its territory. This would explain why the hikers fled and could also explain their unusual injuries. Now, This is a theory that I have never been very fond of as the whole thing just kind of seems baseless. But doing a little more research on it, I have discovered why this theory has become so popular. As previously mentioned, multiple cameras were found at the campsite that belonged to the hikers. This photograph was taken at some point before the hikers had perished, but was generally taken in the area that they set up camp. After analysis, this photo has been completely proven to be 100% real, and the image has not been doctored in any way. What is seen on this photograph is widely open to interpretation. Personally, just looking at it without context, this really does look like some kind of Yeti Bigfoot creature, but others swear that it just looks like a man in snow gear. This image is haunting and it only adds to the intrigue of this mystery. However, despite this looking somewhat like a Yeti, this theory still falls flat in many ways. The glaring issue here is that there were no footprints. Yetis are literally cold weather Bigfoots and not a single footprint of that thing was found. And it also doesn't totally explain the radiation found on the hikers clothing. But considering we really don't know anything about Yetis, perhaps they give off some sort of radiation. But because of the lack of tracks and no real evidence other than the photograph, this remains just another theory at this point. Another popular supernatural theory for this case has been the idea that aliens were to blame for the deaths of the nine hikers. For starters, bright lights in the sky were seen overhead of the Dietilov Pass on the night of the incident. Local Mansi hunters claimed that the lights looked like glowing spheres and matched the descriptions of the modern day UFO. On the body of Semyon Zelatorov, a camera was found with extensive water damage. Despite the obvious damage from sitting in the freezing cold for three months, the film within it was eventually developed which showcased something strange. Through all of the water damage, the photograph seemed to show that Zolotoryov was photographing some sort of light form in the sky. Though this could very well be just because of the damage done to the camera, believers of the UFO theory link this to being an indication that Zolotoryov was photographing UFOs moments before the hikers fled their tent, and maybe this unidentified light form began coming after the hikers and causing them to flee. It is unclear what would have happened from there, but a popular belief is that the UFO caused the hikers to go into a trance. This made them walk down the mountain in a single file line. This would explain the radiation and the fleeing from the tent as well, and it could potentially explain the injuries found on the hikers. I mean, who knows what kind of weaponry or force that these aliens had, and if you believe this theory so far, you might not have a hard time believing that the aliens then attacked some of the hikers and killed them with their strange weaponry. Personally, this remains one of the most interesting theories to me, but due to just how outlandish it kind of is, I, I can't totally commit to it. But with all that being said, it is hard to completely dismiss it. With just how unusual the events at the Dietilov Pass were, many have blamed a strange psychological occurrence on the deaths of the hikers. For starters, many have pinned this entire situation on paradoxical undressing. This is a phenomenon when a person is suffering from hypothermia, yet they feel as if they are overheating. This burning feeling causes the person to remove all of their clothing in an attempt to cool down, and this obviously ends up killing the person even quicker. This was initially used as the likely cause of the hiker's death, 
as it explained why so many were improperly prepared for the cold. Also, the extreme effects of hypothermia could have also caused the hikers to hallucinate or hear things and thus flee from a non-existent threat. And at the surface, this could appear to be the case. But digging deeper, I have to discredit this theory. For starters, the last remaining four hikers took the clothes from those who perished in order to stay warm. Also, a fire was found by the first two hikers who had passed away. All along the Dietala Pass were signs and evidence that these hikers were actively looking for warmth and trying to stay alive. Plus, this theory does nothing to explain the injuries that the hikers had faced. And for these reasons, this likely isn't what killed the nine hikers. Another psychological theory has been that the area around the Dietalov Pass produces low frequency wind, which creates what is known as a Carmen Vortex Street. This ultra low frequency is said to cause panic attacks to many of those who experience it. So maybe the hikers heard this and fled their tent due to this paranoia. And by the time they made it down the mountain, they realized their mistake, but it was too late. Now, obviously, again, this doesn't explain how the hikers suffered such grotesque injuries, and it really just falls flat as well. But I also tend to have a hard time believing these psychological theories simply because of the number of people present at the time of this tragedy. For all nine hikers to have experienced the same psychological phenomenon, and for all of them to react in the same way seems incredibly unlikely. No two minds are alike, so the idea that all nine of them would collectively act in a way that would surely get them killed doesn't make any sense. I mean, not one of them realized that fleeing the tent was a crazy thing to do, or maybe this was all part of it. Maybe the group had a disagreement, which caused a fight. Maybe some members of the group began to slowly lose their minds, while the others remained sane. And these clashing mindsets may have led to a physical confrontation that would have caused the minor physical injuries. Things may have boiled over as the tent was ripped and the group fought outside in the cold. Realizing the mistake that they had all made, the group may have then calmed down as they realized that they would surely die if they continued fighting in the cold. This caused them to head for the shelter of the trees below. It's not a perfect theory and again doesn't explain the horrific injuries, but then again the perfect theory doesn't seem to exist in a case like this. One of the theories that I personally like the best is that the Soviets covered up the real events of what happened. The Dietilov Pass incident was initially buried by the Soviet government for nearly three years after it had happened. And once it was finally revealed to the public, inconsistencies in its reporting and in its autopsies were heavily prevalent. Now many of what we actually know about this case is from the early Soviet reports, meaning that they could have misconstrued the information of the case in such a way that they knew no one would ever discover the truth. But if this is true, then what could they have been hiding? Well, piggybacking off of the previous theories, the government would have had reasoning to cover up a Yeti attack or an alien attack for obvious reasons. And potentially, the military had come in after the group had encountered these things. One member of the search party even claimed that a pair of military boot footprints were found within the nine hikers single file trail. This could indicate that the hikers were ordered down the mountain by a member of the military, and from there, the group was taken care of. But the cover-up could have also been for a more probable theory. This event took place during the Cold War, and Russia was very obviously trying to develop new and powerful weapons. And for these weapons, they would typically test them in remote and desolate regions, much like the area of the Dietlov Pass. So maybe Russia was testing rockets or bombs in the area, and when they went off, it terrified the hikers and caused them to run away from their shelter. And maybe these weapons had actually struck some of the hikers, causing their strange and terrifying injuries. It was even confirmed that rockets were shot at the direction of the Dietilov Pass from a military group somewhat near the area. But officials deny that the rockets would have landed anywhere close to the group. Whatever the case may be, the idea that the Soviets had some involvement in at least covering up the incident seems entirely possible. But the question still remains, why? Despite the countless theories offered for this event, none seem to really solve everything. And it is possible that due to the improper reporting from the Soviets, that the answers to this case will never fully be known. Hopefully someday new evidence will be released that blows the whole case wide open. But until that day arrives, the Dietilov Pass incident 
will remain one of the greatest mysteries the world has ever seen.